Good evening. Call this meeting to order of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education for January 6, 2021. Do I have a motion to move in closed session? Move it. Motion to uh, move in the closed session. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move for the board to meet in a closed session to discuss the performance evaluation of appoint appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, to consider matters that relate to negotiations, to consult with counsel, and to perform an administrative function. I have a motion to have a second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. We will be back at six o'clock for our regular school board meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, the Board of Education meeting will convene for the January the 6th, 2021. Can we please stand for the pledge? I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, board members, uh, we have a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. <clears throat> okay, uh, we also have our minutes, both for our open session on December the 9th, 2020, and our closed sessions December the 9th, 2020. Has so everybody moved. had a chance to review them? So moved. So. Did we officially open? Did we officially open? Open the meeting, open session. I thought I did that when I said the meeting will be reconvened because we okay. planned to do something that we started again. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, the board members had all chance to read the minutes. <laughs> it has a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those in favor. Approved. Okay. We move into uh, recognitions. Very good. I have a few recognitions. I'm going to step up front, but the board members are going to remain seated so that we don't have a crowd up front. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am so pleased to make a special recognition this evening. We do have three of them. The first is for Miss Rebecca Van Aiken. Miss Aiken has stepped, out, has stepped just outside the doors and we're gonna ask her to come on in so that she can hear the wonderful things that are being said about her. Good evening, Miss Aiken, Van Aiken. Miss Rebecca Van Aiken is a Schoology rock star. Centerville Elementary is grateful for all of her hard work and dedication to parents and teachers with her endless Schoology support and knowledge. She's the guru of Schoology and has created detailed directions to send to parents, videos for teachers and parents, a Schoology course outlining the ins and the outs of everything pertaining to Schoology. She's worked countless hours to support our teachers and students in an effort to ensure our students learn, grow, and succeed. Thank you so much, Mrs. Van Aken, for all that you do for Centerville Elementary School students and staff and families. You are truly appreciated. And this is submitted by your principal, Mrs. Farnell. Congratulations. We have a few items for you. Let me get my mask back on. Is there an order to the bags there, Ms. Yes. No, 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 Okay, sorry, all right. So this is for you. Congratulations. You. Was there anything that you wanted to say? I can get the microphone. Um. I just want to thank Ms. Farnell and the rest of our staff and our students. And um, I'm very lucky to be working at Centerville Elementary and I'm truly blessed. Thank you. Thank you. And they truly appreciate you. We thank you. Congratulations. All right. Okay, our next recognition is for Mr. Luke Whitehair. Uh, 
unfortunately, Mr. Whitehair is not able to be with us this evening. He is nursing a sick child. So, Mr. Bell is going to accept on his behalf. So step right over, Mr. Bell. This recognition is submitted by Mr. Bell, our supervisor for visual and performing arts, um, and for Miss Amber Wright, Ken Island High School Performing Arts Department Chair, and Teacher of the Year for 2020-21. And this is what is being said about Mr. Whitehair. Mr. Whitehair is the choir director at Ken Island High School, but he's also much more than that to our school system and to our community. Mr. Michael Bell, supervisor for visual and performing arts, shares that Mr. Whitehair has always been an active presence, always seeing him at middle schools, providing student support. Mr. Bell has seen him working with music students at Graysonville Elementary, doing collaborations after school with our partner for for youth programs. He's taken his students across the state and, um, and the nation actually garnering respect and recognition wherever he takes them. Most recently he volunteered his time to provide instruction virtually to students from Ken Island High School and Queen Anne's County High School to create a virtual performance of choirs for both schools and it was outstanding. Mm -hmm. All simply because of his love for music and his passion for our programs. When asking Miss Amber Wright, our 2020 Teacher of the Year and Kent Island High School Performing Arts Department Chair, she additionally shared this. Mr. Luke Whitehair is one of the most unselfish people I know. He doesn't hesitate to offer help. Mr. Whitehair is kind, courteous, and always finds the good in people. When it comes to students, he jumps to the occasion to share his gift of music. His style is sometimes unorthodox but because of that, he can get his choir to produce the most beautiful sounds one could ever hear. Choral directors all over the state stand in awe as Mr. Whitehair's choirs win so many superior ratings at festivals. Some directors have asked to attend his rehearsals just to see how it is done. The truth is, he loves music and he shares that passion with his students and makes them feel like they're important. For this reason, his choirs are second to none. If you want to see a man who goes above and beyond for colleagues, students, and their families, look no further than Mr. Whitehair. That is so nicely put. Congratulations to Mr. Whitehair. And I am going to offer this recognition on his behalf. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Very good. All right. All right, and finally this evening, we would like to offer a special recognition to Miss Meredith Grussing. She is our shining star. Come on in, Miss Grussing. There she is. Mrs. Meredith Grussing's official title is Human Resources Assistant, which doesn't begin to define the work she does every day, many nights, and most weekends. She was extraordinary before COVID-19, but it seems that the pandemic gave her fuel to raise to an even higher height of perfection and excellence. Most folks don't realize that human resources never closes because the needs of our employees do not cease. Queen Anne's County Public Schools offer um, employees and the community have questions to be answered and problems that need to be solved. Mrs. Grussing um, is the employee with a creative solution to tackle most human resources issues. Many days, the rest of the day starts at 4 p.m. or starts at 4 p.m. and ends at 7 p.m. But I'm, I'm pretty sure you're starting around 6 a.m. and ending at 7 p.m. However, it seems her tenaciousness is get it done and it heats up as most are dwindling down. Thank you to our human resources, a miracle worker. And of course, this is submitted by your supervisor, Mrs. Vanessa Bass. Congratulations, Ms. Grussing. And these two bags, now I know, are for you. And Ms. Bass, won't you come forward so that you can uh, participate in this photograph. These are for you. And, well, um, and we're going to get you to um, hold up your... 
I appreciate this recognition and thank you, Mrs. Bass, for recognizing my work. You know, human resources is my passion. Um, simply to make processes, strategies, and such better. And I'll continue to work hard each day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. our recognitions. Uh, we now will have board and staff involvement. Um, Ms. Harper. Thank you. Um, the Queen Anne's County Board of Education has begun its search for a superintendent of schools with the assistance from Maryland Association of Boards of Education, uh, MABE, MABE. Mr. William Middleton, the lead and MABE consultant, provided an update to the school board on January 4th, outlining the process for this search. Mr. Middleton highlighted the purpose of conducting a national search is to identify the best possible leader for the superintendent position while ensuring a fair, responsive, thoughtful, and legal search. The first step in this process is to gather stakeholder input regarding desired characteristics in the superintendent, as well as identify current and future challenges in the system. After receiving community and stakeholder input, the members will develop the final desired superintendent characteristics and criteria. The vacancy will be advertised starting on February 1st. Applications will be reviewed in March, with the first round interviews starting late March. All interviews will be conducted virtually. The chosen candidate for the position will be announced by June for the new superintendent to officially begin on July 1st of 2021. The survey will be accessible on Facebook, on a, the board's Facebook and website. Any, um, it had, cannot be, it must be submitted to MABE no later than uh, Monday, January 18th at five o'clock. Any questions regarding the superintendent search process or procedures should be directed to William Middleton at MABE, that's wmiddleton at mabe.org, or to me, Tammy Harper, board member at tamara.harper at qacps.org. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Um, I guess you could say attendance. I watched the concerts, the, the choir, and the bands, and they did an excellent job. I enjoyed finally hearing students participating again, so it was nice. Yeah. Helen? Um, I agree. The concert was great. Um, I did, I had a conversation with uh, Sean Connolly. He had, was the one who had presented about the Sporting Clay Target team. And so I was just wondering if we might be able to get that on the agenda to... Yes, that'd be great. That'd be so great. this is a, I think we had this uh, a light presentation about a, six months or a year ago. We can put that on the agenda for, uh, would that be possible to put on the agenda for next uh, meeting the 13th? Mm -hmm. And we'll have a presentation on that. Great, thanks. That, that was it. Mark? Uh, nothing right now. Okay. Um, oh, uh, real quickly, Mr. Smith, um, Mr. Schifanelli has agreed to be the representative to MABE for the Legal Services Association. Those meetings are quarterly, and uh, Mr. Schifanelli is graciously um, volunteering his time to, to be our representative. Sounds fine. Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you. I didn't bring that up. Uh... No. <laughs> it, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I just thought it was part of the job. <laughs> um, today I stopped by the Goodwill Fire Company. They're doing uh, shots for COVID-19. Um, it was interesting to see how the process was working and stuff like that. And I guess uh, I'm not sure uh, Dr. Kane will can elaborate more, but we will be looking at that for our staff and employees in the future. Um, and a program will go out for that. Maybe you could update as much as we have right now, and, and we'll have a plan for that. And I think it's going to be a step forward in this year, 2021. 
Yeah, and just to follow up on, on what you were saying about the vaccinations, our nurses will be vaccinated so that they can support vaccinating our employees. So we're working with the health department to create schedules and, and to make sure that that gets done. So our nurses will get training and, and vaccinated and then they'll support um, vaccinating any employee that wants to be vaccinated. So we'll make sure that happens. So in December, I returned to work and um, participated in my superintendent's environmental um, education consortium. Also met with each of the um, groups, high school, middle school, and elementary school principals. Um, just a few things that are happening this coming month in January. I will continue my participation on the state's uh, task force on the academic excellence for black boys. I will also be participating in the AASA Women in Leadership Consortium that continues. I've been doing that for the last couple of years. And uh, we'll have a, um, a Mayo meeting. That's the Maryland Association for Environmental Outdoor Education. And we believe that we will be meeting most likely with joint labor management as well toward the end of the month. Um, generally, we would. So I'm sure that's um, to be scheduled just yet. I do have some other announcements. Um, one, I want to be sure that everybody is aware of the Sunday Supper Committee's um, meeting on January 10th from 4 to 5.30. It's a Zoom meeting, and we'll make sure that that information gets out. Uh, but I also have some pretty sad news. I am just, as well as the entire Queen Anne's County Public Schools uh, community, just immensely saddened about the passing of our very own Mr. James, or we call him Jamie, Melvin Getty. Welch. He was the media specialist at Kennard Elementary School, previously at uh, um, Graysonville um, Elementary School for, for 20 years. Um, so we are just so very, and, and Centerville Elementary as well. So we are just so, so very saddened about that news. Um, services have been scheduled for January 11th um, and January 12th. That information is being sent out to our employees in the community as well. So I wanted to be sure that everyone was aware of that. Uh, additionally, more sad news, I'm sorry to say, uh, our very own Ms. Farnell and her husband Mark lost uh, his father last week. So our condolences go to the family, as well as to our own Ms. Carol Camp, who lost her mother um, to yesterday. So, you know, it's a hard time right now, but we just like to extend our heartfelt condolences to our Queen Anne's County Public Schools family family and extend our um, our support to you in any way that we can help. So just keep everyone um, in your thoughts. All right. Um, I also have some other comments that I want to make. I'll be making a few comments in response to my sick leave over the past few months. Uh, to begin, I offer my heartfelt gratitude to all who sent well wishes, words of encouragement, and offered prayers on my behalf while I was out. I am truly grateful for your support and your concern during what has been the most challenging time of my professional career of nearly 30 years in public education. But I can say with confidence that the saying, that which doesn't kill us will make us stronger, is absolutely true. Despite the discrimination and retaliation that I've experienced by Queen Anne's County Board of Education, my resolve to fight racism in Queen Anne's County Public Schools is stronger than ever ever. During my absence, efforts were made to dissolve partnerships with contractors who supported equity efforts in the schools. Since my return, I've renewed those partnerships, and schools will once again engage in practices centered on diversity, equity, and anti-racism. I encourage you to pay attention to the conversations that are happening in school districts across Maryland and the country. Our neighbors in Anne Arundel County are not only having conversations about race and racism, but they're listening to their students. Their student member of the board, Drake Smith, is leading the conversation and advocating for actionable changes to education policy that will safeguard against overt and covert racism in their schools. The Anne Arundel County Public Schools Board voted 5-3 to three on a motion to support that board member, Drake Smith, to amend language in the new equity section of their legislative agenda. Black Lives Matter. 
Further, the Anne Arundel County Public School Board included the following language. Anne Arundel Dr. County King, is committed to the ongoing oh, 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 I'm battle. I'm sorry, point, I have, a, I have an issue here. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think you're well aware that the uh, Maryland state laws do not permit a county employee, and they specifically mention the Board of Education. Anyone on the Board of Education, which you are a member of, obviously, are not allowed, and it is a violation of the law, to promote a political party or a political agenda. Now, if you could please, I, I am willing to listen to your uh, diatribe here, uh, but I do not like the fact that you're bringing in a political organization into this public hearing, and I would ask you kindly to stop. Thank you. Anne Arundel County Public Schools is committed to the ongoing battle of confronting issues of bias, racism, intolerance, and social justice through intentionally focused instruction and professional development. We've also infused, this is Anne Arundel County, teaching tolerances, social justice standards into our Project Unity Initiative this year uh, and President, centered Mr. those oh, discussions oh, 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 for students and staff around please, identity, please. diversity, Dr. justice, Kane. and action. Dr. Dr. Kane, please, yes. a second. This is Queen Anne's County? It is. Dr. Kane? It is. If we could focus on issues in I Queen Anne's County. I have freedom of speech, and I can say what I would like to say here. Nothing that I'm saying is against the law. That's... That is correct. That's correct. And in addition, oh, better speak. Calvert County Public Schools created an individualized anti-racist plan to assist employees in understanding racism via multiple dimensions. Montgomery County, Howard County, Frederick County, and so many other districts have decided to choose humanity over hate and to acknowledge injustices toward black people and other people of color and commit to doing all that they can to lessen its impact on students and employees. I have said before, and I will say again, that Queen Anne's County and Queen Anne's County Public Schools should not be exempt from acknowledging racism in our schools and working collaboratively to address it. The problem of racism in Queen Anne's County has existed well before my arrival in 2017. The Sunday Supper Committee has been engaging community members in conversation about race for years. In 2004, a report entitled An Assessment of Disproportionate Minority Youth Representation in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, acknowledges, and I quote, prejudice and racism remain strong in Queen Anne's County. There are stereotypical attitudes, subtle racism that is difficult to challenge, weak cultural diverse sensitivity, a 1960s mindset, segregationist practices, and neglect to build relationships with one another across ethnic backgrounds. Racism is apparent in the educational, economic, and legal systems. More than 16 years later, this observation remains true and is demonstrated on a variety of levels. For instance, Queen Anne's County Public Schools leadership has been attempting to, attempting to get a policy on education equity approved for two years. As governance under the purview of the board is under the purview of the board, approval comes from the board. Board member after board member has been successful in stalling the approval of the educational equity policy for two years. No other policy has taken two years to attain approval from this board, and I question why that is. Despite the challenges, my leadership of Queen Anne's County Public Schools has been marked by several notable accomplishments. I refuse to let the hateful and racist rhetoric of a, of a few cast a cloud over the excellent work that has been accomplished over the past three and a half years. Under my leadership, Queen Anne's County Public Schools has had clean financial audits from both private and state auditors. Queen Anne's County Public Schools earned recognition for the first fully virtual public learning program for elementary and middle school students in Maryland, recognition from Governor Hogan and the Maryland Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education for achieving green school certification in 100% of our schools, recognition for the first blue ribbon school in the district in over 20 years, 
and now the district's first national blue ribbon school. Kudos to Mrs. Welch, the staff, students, and community that support Bayside Elementary. I established the district's first superintendent, student, parent, and staff advisory councils in 2017, which provided a forum for regular face-to-face -face interaction and shared decision-making. As the district's first African-American superintendent, I set professional and personal goals focused on implementing equitable practices across all areas of the school district, including advanced learning opportunities, offering the first African-American studies course in district history, building a diverse workforce, providing cultural proficiency and educational equity professional development for all employees. So this is a reminder that I will not stop speaking out about the issues of racism, injustice or equity in Queen Anne's County and elsewhere. I thank those who've been so courageous to tell the truth about racism in Queen Anne's County, call it out for what it is and make attempts and actions to stop it. I continue to pray that this community can find a path toward awareness, understanding and recognition and rec reconciliation for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Doc, Dr. Kane, I must say I take offense with some of the comments you've just made. Every one of them is true. That's Mr. your Smith. opinion. Mr. Smith, please. please move on with the meeting. I, I would like to re say a couple things. No, uh, let's move on I'm with the, the meeting. I'm the president. I'm going to say something. Thank you. I am hurt that you feel this way, but I am not going to diminish Queen Anne's County of what we've done over the past. We have a good school system. We've had good leadership in the past. We have leadership now. And I do take offense of some of the comments, your beliefs that are not, to me, represents Queen Anne's County. And I would just like that to go on record too. Point of inquiry, Mr. President? Yes. Uh, Dr. Kane mentioned that uh, this board has not approved an uh, equity policy. Uh, it was my understanding that review of that equity policy for the second time, I believe, was set for tonight. I notice it's no longer on the schedule. Is there a reason that it was pulled off for review tonight? My understanding, it was reviewed, but that po is not necessarily a policy. It is a, and Ms. Harper, you can c comment to this because you're on the policy committee. It was pulled because it needs to be a standard, not necessarily a policy from the state. And who pulled Policy. It needs to be a policy. So the, the policy was on the agenda earlier. The policy committee will be reconvening. The policy committee will be reconvening at, at the end of this month, and we will be going back over it, whether it's an equity policy or an equity plan. Okay. Am I correct, Ms. Bass? We will be talking about that then? Thank you. But there yeah. is a policy in the works, correct? Yes. All right. And it has been for some time. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Uh, student board member reports. Uh, Natalie. <laughs> Sorry to bring you into this. In Evening. December, um, oh, sorry, Natalie Smith, Queen Anne's County High School student member of the board. Um, in December, 427 positive referrals were sent out electronic, electronically. These students received a personal note from the nominating teacher along with a gift card to a local establishment. Every Wednesday, the teachers are engaging in per professional development. The next day, they will be addressing disproportionality for students with disabilities and African-American students. Staff and staff and um, policy members will be recognized as Employee of the Month for going above and beyond um, during COVID. And then our electron, electronic Thursday communication continues to be sent out weekly, informing the students and parents of happenings around the school. We are also doing computer repair and drop off for, and you can pick up your um, rental computer while your broken one's being fixed. And our high school continues to be a dis distribution site for grab and go meals. And in January, administration is preparing for the January textbook, textbook drop off and pick up. And it's gonna be a drive through style. And lastly, we're preparing for the rollout zones and regulation, a system to teach self-regulation by categorizing different ways we feel into four different colored zones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Cook. The 
Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Alexis Gross, Ken Island High School student member of the board. So in the month of December, our quarter two interims were sent out, as well as our student of the month uh, was awarded on December 23rd. And then in this month, students will expect to receive an email from administration uh, listing all the materials that they should have in their possession to return later in the month. Um, these emails will be sent out on January 13th and 20th. Second semester schedules will be sent out on January 15th. Uh, the last day of first semester is on January 25th. And then for all the materials from first semester, the collection will be on January 25th, 26th, and 27th. Um, on January 28th, the first day of second semester, and then soon in the month will be on January 29th where administration will go out and deliver the awards again. Additionally, students will receive materials for semester two uh, classes on February 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And then Mr. Schreckengoss told me to disclose this information that the scheduling process for the 2021 and 2022 school year will begin this month. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, citizen participation is going uh, virtual. Mrs. Wright, we had, to my knowledge, this is a day one that came in. Just one, yes. And it will be posted on our website. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, presentations. So first will be the compliance report by Mrs. Towers, who is joining us virtually. She is a Miss... I guess we'll get her uh, pulled up on the screen. Thank you, after Ms. Pullen wipes everything down. Um, so she's gonna share with us um, the report from the TGM um, audit group. Good evening, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen now and we'll review the report. Very good, we can see you and hear you. Thank you. is the form view of the result of the single audit report for FY1. The single audit is conducted annually with the purpose to report on compliance for each of the several major programs on internal control and on the schedule of expenditure of awards that is required by the uniform guidance. No findings or award costs related. And here's the report to that was attached. And you can see the total federal awards that were issued to Queen Anne's County was a little over 5.1 million. And then here's the auditor result page, unmodified opinion, the highest quality opinion that can be offered. And then again, no significant deficiencies, no instances of non-compliance, no significant deficiencies, and so forth. So, any questions? I got one thing on no, on note summary of significant accounting policies. No, I'm sorry, note indirect cost rate. The Board of Education of Queen Anne's County is elected not to use the 10 percent uh, demonetized indirect cost as related to under the uniform guidance. Just why did we do that, or is that just standard, or? We, we actually have a required indirect cost that MSTE has a price rate, and it's usually at a 2% rate, um, and it's a standard formula that's used across the state. Okay, thank you. Of course. Any other board members have any questions? No. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Towers. Stand by. And so our next uh, presentation, Mrs. Uh, McNeil will come forward. She's gonna share with you an overview for English learner um, assessments. Ms. McNeil. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the school board and executive team. My name is Michelle McNeil and I'm the supervisor of Title I, Title III, Migrant and Early Learning. Today, I am presenting on behalf of Title III, which is our English language learners. 
Our pur my purpose tonight is to share an overview of access for ELLs and what's involved in preparing for and administering the assessment for English language learners. I'm gonna be sharing this evening some of our current English learner demographics and an overview of access, which is the assessment for our English language learners. This shows overall data of our demographics from 2017 to current. Um, this year we have 312 um, EL students. Students are identified as EL based on their home language surveys um, that are completed when they register. So EL refers to our English learners. So here's a breakdown of the percentage of different languages that are spoken in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. You can see that majority of our student, our English learners speak Spanish, but we do also have Vietnamese, Chinese, and um, Africanese, and then we have small populations of the other ones. To look at our school enrollment in a breakdown, you can see the enrollment of 312. We have a large population in our northern county at Sellersville Elementary School with 80 students um, that are English language learners. And then, um, you know, their school that they connect with, Centerville, Sellersville Middle School with 24. And our high schools, um, Queen Anne's County is um, our highest population. So when students take um, the WIDA access, they're um, given a language proficiency, and this proficiency allows our EL instructors to provide the instruction that these students need to become successful in their academic areas as an English um, learner. So we have level one where they're entering, they're just using words or phrases, a chunk of the language. Level two where they're beginning to use phrases and short sentences. Three, where they're developing, there's some general and specific language of the content areas. Four, expanding, where there's some specific and some technical language of the content areas that they're working in. And level five, bridging, where we're taking the oral written language um, and comparing that to their English proficient fear, peers. And then level six is they're comparable to um, their English peers. So what is WIDA access for ELs? Um, this is available for, from the WIDA consortium member states as a primary benefit of membership. There are 40 states that are part of the WIDA consortium. Um, it is administered to our kindergartners all the way through 12th grade, English learners, and it is given annually to monitor student progress. It meets our US federal requirements for ESSA for monitoring and reporting the progress of ELs. And it is anchored in the WIDA English Language Development Standards that our certified staff uses to instruct our students. It assesses our students in four domains, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing. In Maryland, in order to exit the EL program, our students have to reach a proficiency level of 4.5. Students who exit, however, are still monitored for two years after exiting the program. This year, with COVID, right now the assessment window is set for February 1st, and it is usually set for a month, um, but this year the state is allowing us to May 28th, 2021, to assess our students. Um, our um, EL teachers are currently working on schedules um, of what it could look like once we have small group and or hybrid instruction for when the students are in building to begin the assessment. And then once we get results, um, the teams will have a deep data dive um, to look at the proficiency levels to see if students are meeting the targets and um, to be able to share that with their leadership teams at each school and that information is also used on their school improvement plans. Any questions? I have a question. Oh. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just out of curiosity, if uh, let's say a second or third grader, an elementary boy or girl comes in and they're at a level one, mm -hmm. uh, just a few words, um, how long before they, on average, are they up, up to 4.5, you know, and, and out of the program? Um, it, 
I mean, it, it varies on the um, language at home as well as in the classroom and how much support and intervention the student is being provided. Sure. Um, it could take um, a couple years to reach that 4.5, um, you know, especially our students that come later in um, the school year. Um, if they're at like third grade or fourth grade, it takes them a little bit longer because they haven't had the chance to really engage in the language as if a pre-K or kindergartner would have been able and could move a little bit faster because they sure. get that phonics instruction, they get building of the vocabulary and things like that. So yeah, I was just curious because you know they're like little sponges, you know, they soak up that language quick. And I was wondering if there was they are. I mean, you can truly really say that our ELs are pretty gifted because they become bilingual, really. Pretty um, yeah, Relative. pretty quickly. Um, so it it just it, it depends on the student um, and what you know they're being exposed to and how much they pick up on the language. Um, but we like to see you know within at least two years, hopefully that you know they're um, you know close to that proficiency level and moving forward. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, seeing we have 25 at Canal and 39 at high schools. Queen Anne's County High School. Does that mean they're not proficient at that level and, and when they're in high school? No, this is just the number of students that are identified as English learners. Okay. So when students are registered, when they register for school, mm -hmm. um, this, the parents have to um, indicate in um, InfoSnap what the home language is. If it's indicated that they have a home language other than English, then um, they become an English language learner. And that provides them that additional instruction that needs to take place for them and then we use the WIDA assessment to um, look at the data to determine where they are in their proficiency levels so so, they, they, so right now it the the numbers don't actually indicate how many are um, proficient it's just that's how many English language learners that we are servicing in, and, in each of those schools okay thank you yep I did a question. So when, at what stage or um, you're in school, do they usually exit the program? Are they all exiting as a result of having achieved that 4.5? Um, when they, it's the 4.5 that um, will exit them, whether they're at second grade, third grade, fourth grade, because they're compared to their peers. Okay. So, you know, we could have a third grader that could exit and become what we call an REL student who we monitor for two years after because they've met that 4.5. And what does it mean to monitor them? What do you do for two years? What does well, we continue of? working, collaborating with classroom teachers, reviewing any other assessment data when it comes to reading and math to see if they're still able to independently work without the support of an EL instructor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, um, how involved are the families usually with the process? Do they get involved a lot with? What part of the process? Um, any, um, especially if the family isn't proficient themselves, do, do they try to get more involved with the student and learn along with them or? Are they supportive of the process? Um, I, I mean, most of our families are very supportive of the process. Um, you know, they they reach out, especially right now with our virtual learning. Um, you know, our EL instructors, even though they're not bilingual, you know, they provide the supports that our students need in order to um, be successful in each of their academic areas. So, um, you know, they're providing those parents those supports as well so that they can um, support their students um, at home. So, but usually, yeah, they're, you know, some of them even want to be a part of it so that they can help their child and also learn the language. Yeah, because we, we find where I work that you, sometimes it's the child that's the interpreter. Correct. For the whole family. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mrs. Right. McNeil. Thank, thank you. you. As we Moving on. Write, that, write that down right real quick. We're going to have Mr. Bell come forward once again when he is able to. And he's going to share a report on visual and performing arts, which is always on fire. Thank you. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, et 
executive team and members of the board. Also, Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year. For the record, my name is Michael Bell. I am supervisor of visual and performing arts, K-12, world languages, school library media, service learning, Title IV <laughs> grants, a few other duties as assigned. Uh, tonight, I'm here donning the fine arts hat in order to provide you with an update on our visual and performing arts programs. More state and national awards, uh, the status of our new National Art Honor Societies and new Advanced Placement 2D and 3D Art and Design courses, as well as our high quality professional development and what that's looked like during COVID. So without further ado, I have a three minute video clip to show you a little my rendition of how it started and how it's going. So with that, Enjoy. Let's go out to my school. Let's do it. changed in a year, but while we started out with these three pillars, collaboration, visual journaling, and building relationships, um, 
it quickly turned into the need to inspire hope, belief, and confidence in our teachers so that they could do the same for our students and for our communities. You know, we suddenly had different challenges and different boundaries, uh, if you say during COVID. And I tell you what, it's, it's the tough move to move toward that uncomfortable place, which our teachers did, and find something new. So we leaned into the barrel of the unknown and we continued by building on prior successes, like our first annual art scene, um, which is two district-wide shows that kicked off uh, at both ends of the district the same week on different days and included K through 12, all students. And it was amazing. It was the first time we ever had a National Art Honor Society induction. And so we needed to find creative ways to keep this going. So while the in-person shows were canceled, schools found other ways to virtually showcase their students through websites, podcasts, and through creative challenges we created across the district for students. Think of like guys grocery games, chopped, but in art for our kids. And they found a, a home in, in doing things like that. And at Kent Island uh, High, to keep their National Art Honor Society alive, Miss um, Schulte, Miss Moyer, and Miss Sage personally drove around and to every National Art Honor Society student's house, staying socially distant to deliver honor cords, a certificate, and a gift with a copy of their NAHS pledge that was used during their virtual ceremony. So this is the kind of dedication that was, that was going on. And we kept the awards flowing. Mm -hmm. So the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards this was the second year straight that these particular students um, happened to win uh, eight honorable mentions and one silver key. Notable scholastic alumni out of 165,000 entries nationwide. Uh, while they were still in high school, include Andy Warhol, Truman Capote, Sylvia Plath, Robert Redford. So these students are in some pretty elite company and it, it's amazing to keep that tradition going. And we graduated the first ever AP, 2D, and 3D art classes at both high schools. In summer 2020, we celebrated this um, historic moment. We had six AP art and design students at Queen Anne's County High, and we had 15 at Ken Island High. And I'll tell you, out of all the students that took the exam, every single one of them passed. We had two students at both high schools that earned perfect scores, four total. So it, yeah, it, it was outstanding. So I gotta give an outstanding job to Ms. Eiler, Ms. Schulte, and Ms. Moyer, uh, who really worked hard with those students. And this is just a glimpse of the new pathways that began last year for our scope and sequence in visual arts, just so you can get an idea of how students can get to that advanced placement course, either through traveling down a 2D track in studio art, which is essentially drawing and painting, or a 3D track was essentially ceramics and sculpture. We also had an I voted state contest winner. Over 28,000 votes were cast statewide. So it was a really big deal. Uh, only one student in each division, elementary, middle, and high, were chosen across the state for this honor. Our own Kara uh, from Queen Anne's County High beat out all other high schools across the entire state for this honor. And the winning designs are currently being exhibited at a year-long statewide tour. And the winners each received a $100 gift card uh, for new art supplies and a governor's citation. And Ms. Zeiler also received a check for art supplies and equipment for their school. In performing arts, more statewide honors. So Ryan, uh, earned first chair trumpet at Ken Island High for Miss Mogensen. Gabby earned all state dance for Miss Wright. And for Mr. Wright at Queen Anne's County High, Courtney earned a second chair flute. And I'll say in the past five years in band, only one student from the Eastern Shore has earned one of these spots. So I give all the band directors all the credit in the world and the dance teachers at both schools that, that collaborated and worked together for these students to be able to earn these honors. All Shore Band, we had a record number, 45 students earned All Shore Band spots. And 
I know we have incredible band directors. It's pretty uncanny. We had every representation, I was so proud, from every single middle school in, in, in both high schools. Um, and I just learned over winter break, and you'll be reading about it in, in the paper in a couple weeks here, that Eliana, a seventh grade student at Stevensville Middle, was just accepted into the Maryland Music Educators Association All-State Junior Chorus. So congratulations to Eliana and her family. And where did all this lead? Well, in 2020, Queen Anne's County Public Schools was recognized as 2020 Best Communities for Music Education. And this was a national honor. Just 754 school districts nationwide were selected. We were one of only six districts in Maryland that were selected. Designations are made to districts that demonstrate an exceptionally high commitment and access to music education. I'd like to thank Ms. Mogensen for uh, her, the band director at Ken Allen High who really worked hard on this application, all the, all the music teachers who were involved in this process, and all of you, because this is not just an award that recognizes outstanding teachers' um, efforts, also administrators, parents, students, and community leaders who have made music education an important part of their child's well-rounded education. So thank all of you for continuing and to support them. We also had more uh, statewide visual arts winners. Uh, we had two students recently earn state spots in the First Lady Yumi Hogan's first virtual statewide student art competition. Um, this is Good Horsemanship by Jaden, who is an AP student at Ken Allen High of Miss Schultes. And also, I Am by Sky. it's right behind Jaden off to the left there. Uh, she's a sixth grade student from Stevensville Middle School. So congratulations to those students, Miss Schulte and Miss Schrader, and their principals who attended the virtual exhibition. Portfolio night looked different, okay? It wasn't at the Academy Art Museum. It was looking like this. But as you can see, you got Miss Schulte up in the top square. You got Miss Zeiler and uh, Miss Ortiz from Queen Anne's County High in the bottom right square. So they collaborated on a district-wide portfolio night so that students could get some background on Savannah College of Art and Design and what needed to go into their portfolios, which was fantastic. Most recently, we put our teacher specialists to work, and <laughs> I gotta tell you, they did an amazing job. Um, we got art kits, uh, and I'll tell you, just to give you a staggering number here, since music and art are a priority for us uh, through federal grant funds, we were able to support our students and teachers by purchasing art kits, enough for all 2,898 elementary school students, 1,897 uh, 1, middle school students, and additional supplies to both high schools as well. Each art kit contains scissors, glue sticks, sharpener, pencil, 20 sheets of mixed media paper, um, watercolor sets, crayons for the elementary level, colored pencils for the middle level. And you know, this was a huge undertaking, but so that students could work safely at home. And they began distributing these kits as they arrived to the teacher specialists at schools, as you can see with their principals and the art teachers are out there. So I had to give a huge shout out to them. We also purchased the necessary band PPE that's been in the works for a while and, and on back order, quite frankly, because they're so in high demand across the country, but we got most of everything in, which is um, instrument covers, bell covers, uh, specialty masks that they have to, to wear to perform safely. So we'll be distributing those in January as well. So it's it, <clears throat> super exciting. Thank you to our teacher specialists. A shout out to them for even taking some pictures with all these supplies. Our Arts Teens of the Week. So if you've been following some of these articles in the newspaper, um, we've been making tremendous strides throughout the district in visual and performing arts. And since my first story on Rebecca Clems up in the top left-hand corner, um, I've covered over 30 visual arts performing uh, Teens of the Week. Um, it's become a community staple and one that everybody really looks forward to, not just because of what the students are doing, but it gets into the why they're doing it, why they have a love for art and, and how their teachers are fostering this uh, creativity within them. So I hope everybody's enjoying them. We've had a, a couple come out recently and we've got some more on the way. 
We've also become recognized as state leaders in the arts. So after my initial spotlight, which I shared with everyone last year, Stephanie Zeiler has since been recognized by the state as an arts leader of the month. And since the pandemic hit in the professional development arena, I personally delivered over 20 uh, virtual workshops across the state and at the national level, including keynotes for the National Art Education Association, the Maryland State Arts Council, the New Jersey Art Education Association, Podcast for Ames, which is the Arts Education in Maryland Schools Alliance, and MSDE, and I was able to bring our teachers along and get them involved. Andrea Schulte uh, gave an outstanding presentation, as did uh, Cassie Hostler. They gave presentations on authentic artistic voice and on encouraging communication with parents in the elementary setting at the state level. So I also sent Cassie to a training through a grant for on social emotional learning through the arts and she's going to be returning uh to us to deliver a presentation for the district on teacher self-care this spring which during the pandemic it's it's very important so where did that lead? Well, a lot of these conversations um, and a lot of these presentations and professional development sessions led to the creation of some panel discussions across the state. And I was asked to do one on planning the 2021 visual arts season as well as planning the 2021 choral season. Our teacher of the year, Miss Wright, was asked to participate in one on planning the 2021 dance season. So we're very much a part of these big conversations that happened right at the beginning of all this during the summer. And over the past uh, couple months, Ms. Passon, the English language arts supervisor here in the district locally, we've delivered eight uh, district PDs, two per day on best practices while teaching remotely. We reached between 225 and 275 teachers at our sessions on each of those four days from September through November. And in addition, uh, all of our art teachers have been invited to participate in the Art Ed Now Winter Virtual Conference, which is a national art conference. And I've been selected by the National Art Education Association to deliver two national presentations and a virtual workshop this March. So we've been busy. <laughs> And while we've been busy, um, we also helped our outstanding fine arts coordinator for the state, Alicia Lee, develop with other state supervisors in fine arts, Arts Together, which is a guidance document for how to proceed safely through the arts during COVID, and social emotional learning through the arts. And that is something that our district was already working on through Tiger Team 4, um, which is making time to integrate social and emotional learning into academics and prioritizing personal connections. I mean, because that's what the arts really do too. Personal connections to help students manage their emotions, which is increasingly important during social learning. And you can download, there's links embedded in all of this. So last, but certainly not least, um, I'd just like to share with everybody that uh, I will be, um, our performing arts you know, team's been rocking it. We had our second back-to-back -back performing arts teacher of the year in Amber Wright. I mean, there's nothing better. As a supervisor, I'm like a proud, proud papa for all those teachers of the year. Um, and I also will let you know that this will all be highlighted. I have an art scene newsletter. This will be my third annual one that's coming out. It'll be out probably towards the end of January. Um, and it's not only going to highlight the visual and performing arts uh, successes, but also our successes in world language with the seal of bioliteracy earners, which we've had more, um, as well as our bookmark state art contest winners for school library media. And uh, Jamie Gettings Welsh had a first place state award winner. So I'm holding off on sending this out until all that's said and done. But um, so that's the, the state of the arts being very, very alive in, in Queen Anne's County despite the pandemic and all that we've been doing over the past year, really, um, since everything hit. So it was a great uh, questions, yeah, answers. I, I have a question about, yes. first of all, it was a great presentation, but I'd expect nothing less since it was the fine arts person putting it on. But thank you. Did you guys, did you have the initiative for the shop local snowflake uh, small business thing that they were doing? 
Are you familiar with it at all? No, that wasn't. Uh, we certainly ha always have students participate and stuff like that because we had students participate with the Haven Ministries and doing things for them with the Art for Your Home projects and things of that nature. Well, I think it's a, a, a really neat thing that they're learning to go outside themselves and, and use those skills and gifts in such a practical way because the way that I had it was this, yeah. this small business uh, initiative from them. They did these big snowflakes that you could put in your window to encourage people to shop um, local during this time. But it was, it was uh, the young lady that spoke was very, you know, passionate about it. She seemed genuinely concerned and it was, it was a neat thing to see. Yeah, and the kids, they genuinely do connect with the things that are very personally, you know, meaningful to them. And to be able to express themselves in creative ways, it's just so important right now, you know, so. Hey, Mr. Bell, can yes. you bring up uh, number six, page number six on your PowerPoint? Sure. <clears throat> and while you're doing that, I'm totally blown away with everything you just uh, put out. And uh, congratulations to all the, all the kids, whether they won an award or were competing. Scholastic. I'm sure there's lots of art, page six. I'm sure there's lots of art that you haven't been able to present tonight, but would have. Sure. So I just got to say that uh, on the bottom there, that's one evil-looking stiletto from uh, Melissa <laughs> Janet, W. Oh, uh, which one? The, sh the shoe oh, down oh, there okay, at the bottom. Okay, the queen is. <laughs> and I, I got a feeling that, uh, that if she wants, she's going to have a uh, career in uh, fashion design, <laughs> major fashion houses. But. Um, I wanted to also bring up the uh, uh, Heather Fullerton. You mentioned you had great band leaders, and you do. We do. Uh, I reviewed the, or I saw the, the winter performances. Um, it was shared with us at the board. I don't know if it's up on their website or not, but if you haven't had a chance to look at they it. They shared it, yeah. Yeah, please, everybody take a look, because it's it's outstanding. Now, all the kids were at home, of course, and uh, it was all virtual, but um, one of Heather's friends, uh, Les Lentz, a resident, has a uh, sound Whatever yeah, and help them, yeah, help them you know, compile you know everything. The yep. Yeah, uh, yeah compile was, everything yeah, and, absolutely. and put it all together, and it's excellent. It, it's really a pleasure to watch. That's hard work, but I tell you what, they've gotten really, they've gotten better at it, and they've really adapted in ways that it, it's it's blown me away even, you know, the, yep. the creative ways to, to highlight these kids. Yeah, so if you haven't seen it, take a look, everybody. But, um, the other thing is, since while I'm here, Mr. Kiefer, I shout out to him. He's, yep. he's excellent, too. Um, because of him, my kids went through two flutes and a clarinet and a lot of boxes of reeds. So uh, he was, he's really good as well. He is a fantastic, all... f fantastic, not only a, a fantastic band director, he's just a, a great human being. He's such I a nice tell. guy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, congratulations, everybody, and excellent job. Keep it up. Thank you. We will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Mr. Dow. It was cute, the Centerville band presentation, if, if you really looked, it included so-and-so's dad on trombone. It didn't say his name, it just said so-and-so's dad. It was very cute to see parents involved in it. All right, and next we have our goal two presentation on safe schools, and we'll have a, um, we'll tag team on that, Mrs. Pullen and Mr. Evans. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. King, board members. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Matt Evans, Supervisor of Student Services. I'm Carla Poulin. I'm the Interim Chief Operating Officer. So we're going to talk about our strategic plan, goal number two, with the purpose being to provide an overview of, of uh, what goal two is, safe schools, uh, the relevant discipline and attendance data, and discuss the prevention and intervention initiatives that both are happening at school and district-wide. Uh, we want to describe the trends and patterns related to student discipline, student attendance, uh, and understand how that discipline and attendance data and how, how it impacts our, our, school, our school climate. 
Um, so just to overview the goal number two, safe schools. All schools are safe and caring environments that promote a positive school culture, digital learning and citizenship, and support developing healthy, responsible students. 100% um, of schools and office complexes will have emergency plans that are complete. 100% of schools will meet system requirements for emergency plan drills. 100% of employee unit group members will be trained for an active assailant. 100% uh, of health and safety violations per site will be corrected. 99% uh, of students will avoid committing a physical assault. 98% of elementary, middle, and high school students who adhere to school policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. 97% of all students will avoid committing a discipline infraction that leads to an out-of-school suspension. 100% of elementary schools, schools will maintain a 95% or higher attendance or average daily attendance rate. 100% of secondary schools will, remain a will maintain a 94% or higher attendance rate. And 96% of all students will be identified as not chronically absent. So while the bulk of goal number two looks at the safe and the caring environments for our students, the safety of our staff and the safety of our buildings is also paramount. So one of the sub goals that we looked at was that 100% of our schools and our office complexes will have emergency plans that are fully complete. Since 2016, all 16 of our Queen Anne's County Public Schools buildings have current and complete emergency plans. Recently, we have migrated to a web-based system. It's a repository that allows those plans to be accessible to our schools so that they can make updates specifically when contact persons in their buildings change. And we also submit these plans to the Maryland Center for School Safety every year in August so we can collaborate with them, we can look at what we can do better, and we get feedback from the Maryland Center for School Safety as well. Another sub goal was to assure that 100% of our schools meet the system requirements for emergency plan drills. As of March 2020, as you know, our buildings were closed for the remainder of the school year, but at that time, we were up to date on all of the required drills for our buildings. We also submit to Maryland Center for School Safety to assure our compliance that we are keeping up with all of those. And we were 100% compliant with everything that we were able to do in such an unprecedented year. Just for your information, we are required every year to do five fire emergency egress drills. Uh, two of those have to happen in the first four months that we're in the building. So those have not yet been completed this year because we've only had small groups. We also do six drills in addition to the fire drills, evacuation, severe weather, lockdown drills, drop, cover and hold, shelter in place and reverse evacuation. One of our third sub goals, 100% of employee unit group members will be trained for an active assailant. This is one that we are very close to achieving 100%. We still have a little bit of work to do. Over the past few years, there has been much effort and much planning and collaboration with local law enforcement officials to offer active assailant training to all of our employees. During professional development in the summers of 2018 and 2019, employees received information not only on the mental health components that are associated with this type of crime, so we can identify warning signs, but they also did a walkthrough of an actual assault scenario so that employees got to practice in a more real-time environment so that they know what to do in the event that something like that would occur. We did have plans for additional training during the summer of 2020. Again, with COVID, those plans did not come to fruition, but we'll continue to work on that. And even when we get to the 100% mark here, we're gonna still continue to practice this and continue to do new types of drills and training just to make sure that everybody's prepared for any type of situation that would occur. In addition to active assailant, we've also offered stop the bleed training and tourniquet training for all of our employees too. 
We have a sub goal that 100% of our health and safety violations per site will be corrected. Some of the health, safety, and welfare inspections that we receive are through the fire marshal's office, through the health department for compliance in our kitchens, for insurance, for OSHA, for the Maryland Public School Construction Program, and also for our boiler inspections. For health, safety, and welfare infractions, these are always corrected immediately and have been done 100%. Moving on to, to sub goal number five, 99% of students will avoid committing a physical assault. Uh, so we've really have met that goal over the past four years. We did have a, a slight drop this past school year, but we still are in compliance with the 99% the rate of students not committing a physical assault. Number six, 98% of elementary, middle, and high school students would adhere to policies involving tobacco, alcohol, and drugs while in school. Uh, again, over the past four years, we have uh, exceeded that goal. We've been at 99%. Uh, now, granted, schools were closed at, in March after March 13th, um, and last year was our, our best year regarding um, those infractions. Can I, ask you, I can ask a question later, so I ask them now, which would be easier. You can ask now, that's fine. When I see 99% for uh, alcohol, tobacco, that, I mean, that's a great rate. It's just we don't have kids coming to school with a, a couple problems or issues and that and we don't I mean we have a 99 percent plus so and and I remember you asked this question last year too uh -huh. and and it's a valid question but when you look at it the elementary middle those numbers can kind of skew that percentage as well okay certainly okay. we're not going to have those infractions well would like to think at the elementary level um, with tobacco drugs and alcohol um, but yes and it's not to say that there there are not concerns that we have with our with our secondary students and we have the students assistance program that's in place where referrals can be made because certainly there's things that are happening outside of the the school buildings that we become aware of and we want to make parents aware of and mm -hmm. so they can get the, the help and treatment necessary yes. um, Number seven, ninety-seven percent of all students will avoid committing a discipline frac infraction at least to out of school inspect suspension. Again, last year being our best year. Granted, schools were closed as of March thirteenth, um, but we were over ninety-nine percent last year and, and have been over nine over ninety-eight percent for the past four years. Um, and again, I attribute that to a, a lot for the past decade. We've had a multi-tiered level of support in our schools, PBIS, where we really focus on proactive, preventative measures to uh, you know to really get the, the the discipline is also it's not necessarily always a consequence but it's it's also teaching so um i feel we're proud of that particular metric right now um Eight and nine, 100% of elementary schools are maintaining 95% or higher attendance rate. Uh, over the past four years, we have not we have not cracked at 90 95% rate as of yet. Um, last year, we did not decrease, which um, is good. You know, certainly, I, I I will say that our attendance stopped after March 13th. We considered everybody present after that, but our report to the state was was cut off at March 13th. So there was no free attendance in in our in our data that was reported to the state. And again, over the past four years, our, our secondary schools have maintained 94% or higher attendance rate. 96% of students will be identified as not chronically absent. So this particular metric is different. That is, chronically absent is when a student is, is absent 10% or more uh, for whatever reason. So in a typical school year of, of 180 days, if a student is absent 18 days or more, they're considered chronically absent. So looking at last year, um, I'd say approximately 135 days, school days we had. So if a student was absent 13 days or, or more, they were considered chronically absent. Now, they could have come off that list after a month, let's say, if they weren't absent again after that, and you know we had the full 180 days, they were only absent 13, well, then they come off that list. So students are added and come off that list until the end, the magic number being 18. You can see that we did decrease uh, the number of students that were not chronically absent last year. Uh, some of that I do attribute to the, the, the shortened school year, um, but that's, that's been a tough new metric for us, and, you know, 96 percent's a pretty high bar, but we're still working towards meeting that. 
Do you find that's a little unrealistic? Uh, it, honestly, yes. Uh, you know, we made some improvements in 18, 19, and it may need to, to be reviewed. We really um, haven't, we, it's really only been the last three years that we've focused on the, that particular, the chronically absentee. Because you can't do anything about folks who take their kids out for long vacations. Right. I mean, that's probably where that 16% is. Absolutely. Honestly, sure. it's, I mean, it's not that they're, they're trying to be truant, but I, I know many families that take extended vacations and they don't care about the 13 days. And, you know, so, you know, that number, even trying to get it to be 85% would probably be a more real, realistic number for the system. Because that stuff, that's out of your control. And we did put in a lot of interventions last year where, where we created letters for, for schools to send out uh, to families where students were approaching chronic absenteeism. And, and certainly principals had the, the ability to not send letters if they, if they knew the situation with families. But sometimes they just felt harassed and said, look, as you said, we're going to take this vacation. And but we felt it was important to make them aware, you know, this is, a, this is something that's being monitored by the state and certainly each school in the school system is being evaluated on those numbers. So I have a question about the attendance thing, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, but in the future, how is that going to be assessed based on what's happening now? Because you've got classes going on virtually where kids may not be tuned in at the time of class, but they do the work. Are they getting credit for being in class even though they're doing it later and they're not attending class? I mean, yes, they should be. And so, so the the child is actually missing class though, the instruction time. So yes. how are you? So as as per the direction from the state, we needed to be flexible when when uh, recording attendance for this school year in a distance learning environment, uh, and certainly had to have provisions in place. There's going to be internet issues. So uh, if a parent on any particular day is not able to access or a student, and they contact either the teacher or call the school front office, that student will be considered present. Um, and there's also situations where maybe for whatever reason, depending on on household logistics where maybe a student can't be present for the actual live synchronous Google Meets instruction, but is still completing the work and they've logged into Schoology and the teacher can tell if they've logged in and they're accessing, they're going to count them present. Now, the, we do have issues with engagement where students are logging in regularly and not necessarily doing all the work, but we had that also when students were coming in the building as well. So there's always that challenge, but it's even more challenging in a distance learning environment. Okay. Thank you. So a lot of the things we have in place that, uh, for prevention and, interve and interventions, school climate teams are big. We've had the addition of social emotional learning and social emotional teams that are, that are part of these school climate teams. Is, that also includes the, the multi-tiered um, systems of support, which is the PB or positive behavior initiatives. Uh, we've had anti-bullying initiatives. Actually, we've had the positive behavior initiatives for over a decade. And, and again, that attributes to our decreasing suspension rate. Um, and really I feel that about the positive school climate in our schools. Uh, cultural proficiency in educational equity, uh, youth mental health first aid, we've had uh, school staff and community members trained in that. Botfin life skills program, which is an evidence-based substance abuse prevention program. Uh, we've had that in the middle school with the, the goal of incorporating both elementary and high school, particularly once we have students back in the building. Arise is our alternative education program. And we've used ATS, alternative to suspension. So um, you know, consequences need to be applied. And sometimes just having a, a student stay home unsupervised is not necessarily, it, it's a consequence that's necessary, but if we can put them somewhere else where they're supervised and, and still can you know, complete the work, we feel that's a better result. So in, in conclusion, the Queen Anne's County Public School System is committed to providing a safe and nurturing school environment. It's based on respect, tolerance, and civility. Um, we believe in providing such an environment requires that clear expectations for appropriate behavior be communicated, appropriate behavior be taught, and consequences for inappropriate behavior be administered. Questions? Sure, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, do we have kids in the Arise program right now? We do. How many? I mean, just a handful, or is it? I'd say approximately 18, and those were students that were in Arise last year. So we didn't really shuffle a lot, um, but we are, and we do meet weekly, my team, uh, planning for the next semester. Some things we have to work out. Uh, we're thinking of targeting 
if possible, ninth graders that are not engaging in that passing classes. And we have found if you leave the ninth grade with less than five credits, you are significantly at risk of not graduating. Right. <clears throat> what about, um, you said you got a 99% students not committing <laughs> physical assaults, right? So that was last about a 1%. Year, yes. yeah. when, when it, what is that, like 75 incidents maybe a, a semester or is it a year? Or? It would be based on a year. For the year? Yes. Is that about uh, uh, what I'm saying, 75 or something in that area? Yeah, 1% yes, of eight, yeah. you know. Right. And um, so alternatives to suspension. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with like teen courts. Have you ever considered implementing one of those? And we have had teen court in this county. It was it was external from the school system, but we did use it. Um, Any success or results? Yes. Uh, uh, some of the more severe incidents we wouldn't bring to teen court. Um, but yes, there were certainly vandalism, things like that. And we, we did find the students were actually more punitive than the adults and the, to their peers. But Strong ever said. All right. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, but Mr. Evans Thanks. is going to stay with yes. us. Yes, I have one more. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Evans, for uh, presenting the information about the virtual panel event, which is happening soon, navigating the possibilities and the obstacles to living your dream as a young black person. Mr. Evans. Let's see if I can find what I need here. There we go. You had faith in me, didn't you, Ms. Wright? <coughs> Oh, that's not it. Wrong one. Wrong one, wrong one. I'll get it. Got it. So yes, a, a virtual panel event, navigating the possibilities and the obstacles of living your dream as a young black person. Uh, the purpose of this is really for in, pre in preparation of Black History Month. This was uh, uh, is being planned by the uh, educational the. The Educational Equity Subcommittee, which is underneath the, the Queen Anne's County Equity Committee. Um, we want to focus on black student success and excellence in an effort to close the achievement gap. This aligns with our strategic plan, specifically with area of focus three, school quality and student success. Uh, the event will be 100% virtual. We'll use Zoom. It will take place on February 4th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. A uh, registration link will be sent to students and parents in grades 7 through 12. The Zoom meeting link will then ultimately be sent to all registrants the day before the event will take place. Uh, about the event, it was black Queen Anne's County public school graduates will provide students with their, their stories of just how they navigated uh, successes and, and obstacles through middle and high school, post-secondary education, and the world of work. Uh, they will also answer questions from facilitators regarding their academic path while in high school, their opportunity to take advanced courses such as honors or AP courses, navigating the college application process, what kind of help or support they had uh, doing that, and also um, how that ultimately led to their success in the world of work. Just looking at our county st uh, stats as per the 2020-2021 uh, enrollment report, black students make up 5.94% of the student populations. Students of more than one race, 5.86% of the student population. And then looking at our, our actu actual certificate employees, which includes teachers, PPWs, school counselors, school psychologists, assistant principals, supervisors, and principals, which make up 3.15% of the professional staff in this county. So the Educational Equity Subcommittee felt it was important for, for students of color to be able to see um, uh, successful uh, black graduates from Queen Anne's County Public Schools. 
So it's our hope that this is actually be the first of, of many panel events going forward. Uh, the equity committee and specifically the, the educational equity subcommittee are committed to maximizing the academic and social emotional well-being of all students. Um, the future panel events would could target any groups as, as needed or would be willing. Could be students with disabilities, mental health, ESL, um, and certainly that's our plan going forward. Yeah, I, I uh, must agree with agree with this, and I also like the conclusion that you know we must be all students. Yes, and we also have other groups, uh, various groups that uh, need to do this at a, at a different levels. Absolutely. But um, this is a good start. Uh, but I do want to m make sure that we include all our groups that need this help. And it's our intention to expand our educational equity subcommittee to include members that represent those groups as well. Because I think even people that graduate with college expectations and stuff like this, AP classes, you know, we get into the real world and it's different. And I think having mentors come back at all levels can help a variety of students understand how they'll navigate the future. Because I, I think this is, you know, probably even more than it's ever been with the fastest the world's going. Uh, a lot of these students need this. Absolutely. Will this link be shared with all students? Uh, just students and families grades 7 through 12. Okay. Will we Mr. get this link? Mr. Evans, how many we can, can get share on that Zoom call? Uh, I, I've made available 300 tickets, but and, and I'm not sure Zoom's capacity. I've set up the flyer and the, the registration link. I haven't set up the actual Zoom call yet, but um, and I'm not as familiar with Zoom. I know Google Meets is it has a limit of 300, but I think Zoom is greater. And also, are there, what other are there other activities currently planned for um, Black History Month or just as virtual forum? That's th this is one that's specifically coming from the Educational Equity Subcommittee schools individual schools are doing activities as well. Okay, and then regarding, because I know, I, isn't our biggest um, minority is Hispanic in the Queen Anne's County? Subgroup, so I believe that percentage is about 10%. So are, are we, is there anything that, you know, I, I have a concern too for all of the, the, the students. Are we doing anything, is the equity committee doing anything to talk about Hispanic heritage or history or? Absolutely, and, and, and as I said, we're looking to expand the members of that group, uh, okay. certainly to have a representative for that group. And, and honestly, that's really what we're looking to do after we finish with this event is plan the next one. Great, thank you so much. If if it's limited to 300, that could fill up pretty fast, I would assume. It could, and and, I, and I'm not sure on that uh, as far as Zoom. Um, but we would get a update, and you'll, you'll, you'll be monitoring this, I yes. guess, and then gets back to some of the highlights of what was what was done in this program. Absolutely. We're looking to hopefully send the uh, the flyer out with the registration link, and I did send Dr. Kane that just this, this evening before I came down here. Hoping to send that out early next week, and then I'll be able to keep track of how many registrants we have going forward. Maybe you could, if, if we find out there's a room, then the board, any board members could uh, oh. tune in. I wouldn't want to... I, have well, a I, think, I wouldn't want to have a student missed opportunity, but I also would like the board members to have an opportunity to see it too. Understood. So I'll find out the maximum capacity okay. for sure. Hey, Matt. I think this is great. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned on the first page there the achievement gap. And this is an effort to help close that because the achievement gap is a somewhat persistent phenomenon, as I'm sure you know. And for those, everybody on the board, I'm sure, knows as well. But for those who don't, since. Uh, the, uh, at a national level and at, at state levels, there's been a consistent gap probably since they've been taking uh, statistics on assessments in English language arts, math, and that sort of thing. And of course, the states and, and the schools break it down into race. And uh, there's a gap between blacks and Hispanics, Hispanics and whites, whites and Asians. Asians are consistently in the top tier, uh, kicking everybody's butt. <laughs> And uh, so closing that achievement gap is it's, it's something that I think the board should focus on um, in the coming years. Uh, and I'm glad that the local management board has brought this up. Now, just to make clear, you're on the you're wearing your hat right now for the local management board, right, in regards to this. So I'm wearing my hat as I facilitate the, uh, the subcommittee of the Queen's County Equity Committee, which is 
part of the local management Local board. management board. Right, which is also known as the, what is it, the... So the Sunday Supper Committee... Partnership for yes. Children and Families, right? And then there's various subcommittees. Correct. And you're the chair of the County Equity Committee? Of the... Uh, so... I would say I'm a co-facilitator or a co-chair. Okay. So this is actually something that's being coordinated by a different, not the Board of Education, it's the local management board, your subcommittee that you're on is um, coordinating this and preparing yes. it, right? Yes, that's correct. Right, which is excellent. And um, I'd like to see more of these, as you already mentioned, you know, in the future. And not only targeting, you know, the black students or the Hispanic students, but, um, but all the students, if you could do that, because I'm looking, and what I really like about this is we've got black Queen Anne's County prior graduates coming back to relate their experiences in college and the in the real world, you know, um, success and work and all that stuff. I'd encourage everybody to sign into this when it occurs, and um, and to do something like that for that all the students could participate in, or more students, um, because as you say in your conclusion, one of your mission statements is success and social emotional well-being of all the students. So just for an example, um, you know, finding uh, prior Queen Anne's or Queen Anne's County graduates that uh, just for example went into the military, either enlisted or ROTC or the, you know, the uh, military service colleges, West Point. See if you can round up some of them and, you know, talk about their experience in the military and that sort of thing. Because uh, I know the local management board focuses on poverty and, you know, those households that are under the poverty um, lines. And uh, everybody knows that uniform services has always been one way out to break that chain um, for kids and, you know, learning life skills and that sort of thing. So I think this is great. And um, I look forward to, to seeing more more of these programs every you know couple months or whenever you guys can get them together. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the idea about the military. That's sure. Good. Any ideas? If you want to bang heads with me, I'm, you got my email. <laughs> okay. Good job. Thank Any you. other questions? Yeah, I'm wondering if they can do something since we, we can't have a multicultural night <clears throat> like the one they had last year, if they can do something like this <clears throat> to do virtual or Hispanic heritage, African American heritage. Mm -hmm. We do both, oh. so we can we can check with the schools because you know the schools generally do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Miss Rosario, I believe she and her husband kind of spearheaded that effort last time. It, it would just be neat if they could. You mean the one this. we did at Queen Anne's? Yes. Uh, okay. The that, yeah, that the multicultural mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they could do something virtual like this to keep that alive. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Okay, we're at our break. Exactly. It's uh, 725. Let's take about a 10 minute break and we'll come back at a uh, quarter of eight. Thank you. Okay, we were, we're back in session. Uh, it's 850 or 846. Uh, our human resources report. Mrs. Bass. We've received that in, I think, uh, does any board members have any questions? I make a motion to accept the human resource and sub bus sub substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session. Second. I have a first and a second. Any questions? Call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 It passes. Okay, transfer request. We've got a lot of so she can. Right. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, the next item I bring before you tonight is to request the Board of Education approval of a transfer request with budget amendment number one. Since the approval of the adopted FY21 budget, the unrestricted budget, there have been additional uh, items that need to be addressed. We'd like to increase other revenue under non-public price placement of 250,000. Federal administration to increase that by 20,000, and that is under contract services for license agreements for school funds online for each of the 14 schools. 
And then the other one is to increase other instructional costs for contracted services or psychologist services of $110,000. And we go no further down. We'd like to see from fixed charges to reclassified into mid-level administration at 20,000 for the school online. And then from fixed charges to the other instructional costs for those contracted services. And I actually have a, I don't know if this is helpful or not. I have a difficult spreadsheet that kind of highlights the changes. If we take a look here on the second column here, left is your approved budget. And then this is the requested amendment here to increase other revenue of 250,000. And that would increase the special education budget of 250,000. And then from fixed charges, 130 out of 130, 110 going to the other. 20 and mid level. This is basically transfer request we pick the different categories. Okay, thank you. Do all board members have that information in front of them? Any questions? I have a questions? question. Um, Stars, on the, the fixed charges to contract services, the 110,000. Uh, what psycholo um, psychologist services are we doing now that wasn't budgeted for that was the 110,000? Right, uh, this is can identify services of non-special ed students, and um, maybe Dr. King can speak more to that, but this is for non-special ed students that are receiving additional services. So from year to year, we generally don't, we, always, we don't always know how many students are going to need psych services. And so we have to make adjustments when they come and they require the services. We just have to provide them. You'll see that this is an item that comes up every year um, and, and it's hard to budget for them, especially on a, on a really thin budget. But when we get them and we're required to provide services that weren't anticipated, we just have to do it. So is this a new contract? to take care of the non-special ed students? Is it something that just happened recently? So, the I, 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 this was a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, this was a contract uh, that was taken to the board, I believe, and uh, this was all the help. Okay. Is it possible to get a copy of these, of the contracts? To take of a look. course. Okay, because I know, remember when we spoke last month too, there were a couple of items that came up and I really like to see the line items and stuff like that. So um, are there any other current contracts that we've gone into recently that that we can take a look at or get comp, you know, as a new person, I just like to really see how we're spending money. Um, and so are there other contracts that we can get copies of that have come up maybe in the last few months? Right. One thing that I can do, I can provide a list um, that has all the contracts that have been approved by the board and a copy of them and send them out if that's helpful. That would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. Of course. That'd be good to put in there for our next week's thing because we'll be going into the budget and stuff. will be a better explanation at that time too. It would be great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, do I have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, just one thing. Only because on the second page, it's the agenda item for the Board of Education. It has the action and then I guess where you would sign. It may not be important, but it says 250, 00. So it could be, it's just missing a number. I just don't know if it's important since this is going into an official document. On the uh, transfer request but that has action. So page two, it's got the board approved and the board president signature. But in the action, it says with the result of 250 comma zero zero. It's got, it's got 250 comma and there is one zero missing at the end. Um, 
we can take care of. Well, if it's important. It, 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 I will adjust that right here. Thank you. So I make a motion um, for the approval of the transfer request with budget amendment number one, FY21. Fiscal impact of $250,000, increase to total budget revenue and expenditures, budget source, other revenues, non-placement, non-public placements. Do I have a second? Second. Any more further discussion? All those in favor by saying aye. 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 That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next discussion item will be update of opening schools. And Mr. President, I have a point of information. Mm -hmm. If I can proceed. Um, Mr. President, uh, part of the Queen Anne's County Public Schools vision is to provide students with a world-class education. High school education as well as college education directly affect success in life, including the ability to seek and pursue rewarding jobs, vocations, and careers. With few exceptions, Queen Anne's County Public School students have been attending classes virtually since March 2020. At the December public board meeting, Ms. Forbes informed the board that students are not engaged, that's quote, are not excited, are not attending classes and that students have, quote, terrible organizational habits and in some, quote, are struggling. Recognizing that student letter grades reflect academic progress and learning, quarter one letter grades have plummeted significantly, Ms. Forbes reported, since the start of the virtual learning in comparison to the year 2019 as follows. In the high schools, an increase of nearly 17% of students are receiving Ds and Es in quarter one. And compared to 2019-20, 11 out of 100 students were in the DE category versus 28 out of 100 in this quarter. Middle schools increased 15%, grade schools increased 16%. Last year, nine out of 100 grade schoolers were in the DE category. This year, it's 24 out of 100. These failures have been most significant in math and science, Ms. Forbes reported, including Algebra 1. And with many high school students dropping out of advanced math courses, AP courses, because of the difficulty of learning virtually. It can be deduced from the above metrics that other grades have declined within A through C categories. The director for the U.S. Center for Disease Control has since April 2020 consistently, and as late as November 2020, stated that children need to return to in-person classes. On November 28, 2020, the director of the National Institutes of Health indicated that schools have not been the major driver of community spread. The superintendent of the Maryland Department of Education in October 2020 urged schools to reopen in-person learning in some form for 2021, the measure being supported by the State Board of Education who reaffirmed their support and their position on December 7, 2020, just several, a month ago. The acting deputy secretary for the Maryland Department of Health affirms that the state guidelines regarding positivity rates and reopening are not hard and fast rules. State officials recognize that each system must respond to unique characteristics related to the layouts of their own buildings, their student needs, and other issues. State Board of Education guidelines as amended on November 23rd, 2020, do provide for reopening even when the seven day positivity rate is equal to or higher than 5% and the seven day case rate is greater than 15 out of 100,000. The State Board of Education, the CDC and other organizations have promulgated guidance for schools desiring to resume some form of in-person learning that includes protections for teachers and personnel most at risk to severe difficulties regarding from COVID. As we discussed earlier, uh, Queen Anne's County teachers will soon be offered the option to uh, take the new vaccine voluntarily uh, as the vaccine has been uh, now coming into the county in, in greater numbers. Since May 2020, Queen Anne's Public Schools have researched various options for a return to in-person learning, including various hybrid models and a new full day hybrid plan. 69.9% of the parents of school children responding to a Queen Anne's County uh, school poll indicated that they wanted some type of in-person classes for their children between two to four days per week. Mr. President, I'm making a motion that we vote to reopen schools beginning on January 28th of 2021. That's when the uh, new semester begins on a hybrid plan 
which we also know is a full day uh, plan that offers two days of face-to-face in-person learning in the schools with the constraint that uh, the reopening follows the safety practices and protocols recommended by the uh, state and federal uh, various agencies aforementioned and that there is an option option for students who do not want whose parents do not want them to return to school that they may stay virtual i have a motion do i have a second for discussion second okay open for discussion members i have concerns about it um as i've stated before because the metrics are so high right now um I mean, just today we had 76 positive cases hit our list here in this county. That's a huge concern for me. Um, the past 10 days on our list of the 426 people who have hit the positive list, 51 of those folks are school-aged children. Those are school-aged children that could bring it to school and spread it to their families and generations. That, that concerns me. Um, I know a lot of folks say if kids aren't as affected and, you know, a lot do recover quickly, but the older folks in their family will not be that fortunate. So that concerns me. Um, it also concerns me that we have a high number of teachers who will not physically be in the classroom should we decide to do this. So a lot of these kids will still be getting virtual learning sitting in a classroom. I think parents need to know, schedules need to go back out, saying what their schedule will be both for middle and high school, if that class will be a virtual still, or if it will be in person, so that they can make an informed option whether to keep their child at home or is it worth sending them. And same for elementary students, because their teachers could change, and that's a huge concern for both the student and the, the parent. That puts a big stress on a child who's already made a connection with a teacher. So those are my concerns with doing this. I can, uh, I do appreciate the concerns, um, but I had a question with the t uh, teachers that may not be coming back. I know we have 17 long-term subs. Uh, Dr. King, can you say how many short-term subs do we have? We have um, 41 reactivated substitutes. Because okay. I, I, I do think that it would be nice too if we could get our short-term or long-term subs trained on Schoology. I know a couple of uh, subs have reached out to me and said they're even willing to pay to be trained. Oh, they don't, they don't and, need to do Well, that. I'm, just, yeah. I'm just telling you that's yeah. how anxious they are to learn Schoology. And since a lot of it can be taught uh, virtually, they, they would like to do that. But I really feel as if we need to give parents they need to have the control and they need to decide whether they're going to send their children or not. Um, and they make, they are in the best position to make the best decision for their children. And so that's my biggest concern is letting the power lie with the parents. Because you can choose to be virtual 100% if you want to continue it and that's fine as well. We just want to be able to have options. Um, it's a tough decision. Um, We've been out of school since March. In another few months, we'll be out of a year. I think a lot of kids are very falling behind. I mean, we've heard this. Um, it's gonna, it's a real issue. I think to have kids have the opportunity to be back in school, uh, there will be some bumps. I think there's some issues that are brought up as far as teachers, what teachers you will have. And I think that's a personal decision that the parents need to make once the superintendent gets out the plan and how it's going to be implemented and what will happen, um, then people can make an informed decision. And uh, for each person, it might there's no right or wrong. It's what sh your choice will be. But I think we do need opportunity to get our school opened um, when we can. And I, um, you know, we have some things in the works that are looking positive. I understand some of our metrics are very negative right now and um, you know of course we want to deal with safety but I'm hearing from the uh, Dr. Sammons governor you know we want things open back up uh, and they got to be done in a safe manner and uh, it's not an easy choice for any of us up here but I think we all have to sit there and decide what we want to do uh, we got a motion I think everybody should weigh in and then vote the way they feel comfortable with 
Tammy? Yeah, I think we are jumping the gun on this. We haven't had any recommendations yet from the superintendent. We have not heard the numbers of our teachers and staff members that are going back into the buildings. Um, we need to hear from them. We need to hear from the principals. We need to get a, we need to get a state of the union before we have this motion. Well, that, that's my that is my opinion. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kane, do you have any input? I certainly do. So we do have 41 substitutes out of generally 250 is what we generally have, daily substitutes. We have 34 teachers who are on um, AD, have ADA accommodations, meaning that they have to be home and work virtually right now through the end of this school year, which means that uh, they cannot come into the classrooms. Um, and I do sympathize with parents and understand the angst that everybody has with regard to bringing students back to school. School. Um, but our numbers are higher than they've ever been um, right now. So I think this is not the right time. I am very concerned with our teachers um, coming back. So we cannot cover uh, those classes right now at this point with 34 teachers that must teach from home if we're going to bring children back to school right now. So we do need to be concerned about that. And, and while we think about that, we have to also think about about the physical distancing that has to happen. So if I, it's not as if I can combine classes and have 20 kids in a class. Our classrooms aren't that large to maintain social distancing and, and, and have that many kids in a class. So all of those things are of concern. The buses are of concern. We have about, I think, seven drivers that are out currently. Um, so that is going to be an issue. So it's not just a matter of how are we gonna get the kids um, you know, taught in schools, but how are we going to get them to school? Um, so that's going to be an issue. So we have a number of things that we need to be thinking about. And yes, we do need to go back to the table. If it is going to be a plan to restart school at uh, on January 28th, and that is in a hybrid way, that's 50-50. So that's 50% and 50%. So that means any child who wants to come to school will be able to come to school. And we have to make sure that we're able to accommodate their learning when we get them to school. Um, and we have to be able to get them to school. So we have to be thinking about those kinds of things. So those are technicalities. And, and again, you know, it's a tough situation to be in. The metrics do not look good. Um, but, you know, it has been made clear to me, you know, I don't get a vote on this, but I think that you need to heed the, um, the considerations that I'm speaking about tonight. We appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just it is, it is a tough decision for all of us. And we get that. But I I just really believe that with the support from us, um, that you, the, just the skills and the and the staff that we have, um, it may be challenging. But you know, we've got a lot of Tiger teams that have spent a lot of time and effort putting together uh, programs. And I think that if we pull together, um, that we need to give it a try. Um, again, putting the power back in with the parents, because uh, that's where. It belongs. They need to make those decisions because we've just heard from a lot of parents that's just not working. And if it's working for you virtually, then that is wonderful. And if you want to keep them virtually, but we need the options. And let's be clear: the, the board's role is to, you know, make the vote. We're not going to get in the weeds. And mm -hmm. you know, that Dr. Ken, you're going to, you know, if we vote to reopen, uh, there's no doubt it's going to be a challenge. Um, we'll be here to support you. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that either. But we're not going to get into the weeds and, you know, go to the classrooms to start getting into the technicalities, like you said, that's going to be Dr. Kane, that, that's going to be on your plate. So um, our job is to decide whether or not we're going to reopen schools on January 28th per the motion. Um, we've, you know, had a lot of discussion about this, a lot of thought went into it. <clears throat> um, a, a lot of consideration of the research, which I just read, uh, I really think if, if we don't reopen it now, then, you know, it's going to be another discussion and we got to have another round table, et cetera, et cetera, to discuss details that are the superintendent's charge. So I am for, obviously, if you haven't figured it out by now, I do believe we need to reopen schools. Um, the metrics may be high right now. On January 28th, they may be less. We'll be back here in February talking about this again, the technicalities, and nothing will have happened. On the other hand, um, if we do open and there is an outbreak in a school, then that school closes down. I mean, it's, it's that simple. So... Um, 
I, I still move that we have the vote. And I, I want to be clear. Thank you for that. I want to be sure. clear. It's not just about just about an outbreak in a school. It's about who's going to teach the children because we have teachers that are not going to be in buildings. Period. I have a question about that because all your teachers who were on CARES leave, that ended. Correct. Are any of them applying for ADA leave now? I, I don't know that there's carryover for those people. I know that we have 34 who are on ADA, which is what we need to pay attention to at this point through June 2021. Great. I don't know if we'll get any new requests. They come in every day. Um, I do have some in the waiting. Actually, to the left of me. But, so I, I really won't know. Every day that ADA requests may change. It's 34 tonight at uh, 8.08. It may be different in the morning, board members. So with that said, I think it's very important that the second semester schedules go out. Mm -hmm. And if Algebra 2 is going to be virtual, it needs to say virtual. And then a survey be done. Are you willing to send your child back? Because I know if my son has four classes in high school and only one teacher is coming back, is it really worth putting him on the bus or bringing him to school? to sit in front of the computer again when he can be comfortably and safely doing that at home. On the flip side, if he's got three teachers here, it may be worth it, but I think parents need to know what the realistic picture is going to be sitting in that classroom before they weigh in on a survey or make a decision. You know, it, it, it's, it's tough and it's, it's, a, it's going to be a lot of moving parts. Um, some teachers will teach it virtually because, you know, people will have the option of the virtual if they want to stay that way. So, you know, we're not opening up our schools to everybody. I mean, let's face it, some people are not going to want to right. come back. So that could be a thing. And, and, and it's tough because it's not just a strict number. You know, it might, it might be a math teacher, it might be two math teachers, and then you're in a, in a jam. But it's a challenge I think we just need to have to face and do what we can do to give the opportunity for students to get back in school. Uh, I just think they are losing so much by not having personal one-to-one -one teachers. I mean, that's what teachers do. They teach, and they need to be there to teach. Um, I know some of them can't be because of reasons, but I think we have to move in the directions of opening these schools, my personal opinion, and it's been that way since September, to open them up um, and, uh, and, and our hybrid model with as much learning as a whole day can, can give them. Do I have any other discussion? Okay, I'll have a uh, motion and second. I'll call. Ms. Wright, could you do a roll call on this? I will. You want to repeat the uh, motion? I can. <laughs> Hold on one second. The motion is to reopen schools beginning January 28th using a hybrid plan, also known as the full day plan that provides two days of face-to-face -face or in-person learning per week, following Maryland safety practices and protocols, and with the option for students who want to remain virtual to do so. I believe I covered everything. And I think that was seconded by Helen, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes, I'm okay. to the roll call. Ms. Harper? No. Ms. Morissette? No. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Schipanelli? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have three yeses and two noes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. We move on to information items. Uh, we have policy. For second uh, out, it's gifted and talent dedication of instruction 616 and gifted and talent dedication instruction 616-1. I this make the motion to send uh, for second uh, public review policy number 616 and its regulation number 616.1. Second. Uh, for discussion, uh, I'm looking on the stakeholders distribution list. I have no response to that. I mean, nobody. there were no comments for first read and still are not. They are not. Okay. Can I ask a question about the stakeholders um, distribution list? I had, I know I had a question about it last time because it seems this is something that's going to come up regularly. How are the stakeholders determined? And then how do we reach out to those stakeholders to ask for their? Um, 
their opinion because it feels as if maybe would we get more feedback if we just use the stakeholders where that particular item pertains to them? Does that make sense? It's, I mean, well, if I'm into the fine arts, I may not. Well, yeah. It looks like to me that you know we have policies and they go to the stakeholders are our citizens of Queen Anne's County. Well, I understand that, but as I mentioned before, they've got Ken Island American Legion, Centerville American Legion, but not Graysonville American Legion. Like, wait, why leave that one out? Um, there's no VFW. There's no Economic Development Commission, because that is something that I talked about that I would I would like to appoint. Um, I would like Dr. Kane to appoint someone from the school system to be a liaison with the Economic Development Commission, because they have an amazing workforce development program. We do. Um, and so... That would be nice to have that appointment, especially now that we've gotten the position open where Queen Anne's County will share with Ken Island a point of CT information. Person. Oh, sorry. Mr. Smith. Yes. Sticking sorry. back to the policies, we can always expand the well, list I just, of stakeholders. I didn't know, well, I guess my question was, how do we come up with these stakeholders? That is just an old list, and, okay. and stakeholders can be added, and I and everyone should get all the policies since they are all community members. How are I, they? How do they receive? I would think any board member that would like to add anybody on this distribution list, it would be open to anybody to. Any request that we could add to this, Dr. K, would that be a Absolute, problem? Absolutely. We can. I mean, I think the more information we can get back from the public, the better. Uh, absolutely. And it can almost be like much. <laughs> you, you get these emails. You can unsubscribe if somebody. I mean, I've been here for not as long as a couple other members. A lot of people don't get back to it, uh, but there's no reason not to send it out. We just got to keep trying to get to the public as much as we can. I think if anybody has an organization or a group that wants to sit there and receive this, let's put it on because I would love to see five or six responses when I see zero most times. Right. And uh, I think that can be a, that can be a, a challenge of this board because we do hear from the public. Um, and Dr. Kane or anybody else, staff members, feel that we can add somebody. I have no problem of running it by you. And, and, and Mr. Tolley, he's our CTE supervisor. He, oh, yes. Yep, he yeah. serves as our liaison for economic development. Well, he, I, I, I just came off of EDC. I'm sorry, after six years, I don't mean to um, upset Tammy. I'll try to be quick. But um, we, he hasn't been at the meetings in um, a year, maybe. I think he only came a little while, so I'm not sure what he, you know, he may just be busy elsewhere, but maybe someone who doesn't have as much on their plate or something, I'm not sure. He, he's the appropriate person. I'll speak with him. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we approve the second reading of we this. We have the motion. We have a motion, motion and a second. second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those ayes have it. Okay. Moving on to our expenditures report. If everybody get that up on there. Oh, there she is. Good evening again. Tonight, I'm bringing before you the detailed expenditure status report for period ending December 31st for your review. Items of note under category two contracted services. Transfer request was approved for 20,000, so that would bring that back into the positive. The transfer request for contracted services under category five would bring that to the positive, and as well as the transfer for special education. Any questions? Do any board members have any questions? No, not at this time. March 3rd, 
for her, her budget and her board approval. And then in May, the Board of Education approved budget would be permitted to the county committee report. Okay, thank you. Do any board members have any questions on the schedule or how we're going to? Mm -mm. Hearing none. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Okay. We're now down to transfer notice 1003. Um, Which, can you pull that up? I can't open it. You can't open the transfer notice? No. She's going to open it. That's a I Word think. document. I can't get mine up, can no, you? That's a Word document for me. Mine, I got mine up. I, I was going to say, they, she's opening it right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay. Can we just get can, an email Can you make, your make that bigger at all, Ms. Towers? Oh. Enlarge. Yeah. Yeah. That helps. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, I, I can't get it open. This is my informational item. This memo serves for the monthly transfers between the category groups, between those categories one through fifteen. So, in accordance with section five dash one hundred five of the annotated code, we have count for the course of following transfers within each of these major categories. So we had a transfer within the first category, which is administration, from salaries to contracted services of 21,000. And this was to, for the contract for the superintendent need, and then there was a contract at CFO. So it, in essence, we took some money from salaries and moved it to contracted services within that category of administration of 21,000. The next item, the category two, to mid-level administration. We had to move 12 open from other charges to set up to cover lead payout. The fund transferred from the charge that included travel, removal, and conferences. Category number six, education. A transfer of 310,000 across separate names to consortium and non public public. And then the last one, Board 10, is operating appointment. Other charges to contract of 50,000 for maintenance contracts to your equipment from university fields realized to date. Question. Any board members have any questions on this? No. No, we're fine right now. Okay. Becky, you go show Thank me you. How to do that. I'm sorry, Doug. You gotta show me how to do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Towers. Okay. And that's in category, so there's no action taken on that. Um, future school board meetings. We will be meeting next Wednesday for a budget work session, and then the following Wednesday on January 20th for a budget work session. That will be our meetings for uh, January, and of course the first Wednesday of February will be our next regular scheduled board meeting. Will the work session start at 4.30 or 5? Uh, for Michelle, are you already 4.30? I'll make the I mean, we can do five. I mean, it's a, is it a Normally problem? for five to eight. Huh? It's usually five, five o'clock. Okay, we'll do five o'clock. So we'll schedule from five to eight. Okay, does anybody, any okay. other board members? I, yes, uh, Mr. President, I make a motion to amend our agenda to change 13.0 to executive closed session. Oh, to add an To have an executive closed session. I have a make a motion. <laughs> I have a second. 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 Pursuant to the general provisions, Article Do you, wait, 3. Mr. Uh, oh. point, of, 
point of order. Fine. We have to finish the motion on changing, amending the agenda before you can make the motion to go into closed session. All right. I, have, I have a first and a second to amend the agenda. Can I have everybody in favor? Say aye. 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 Carries. <clears throat> Is there any uh, point of order, Mr. Smith? Do we have any other business to uh, I conclude? I mean, does any other board members have session? anything? Or Dr. Kane, would you have anything you bring up at this board meeting? No. Okay. Then that's, that's it for the motion to move into closed session. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3 305 and 3 104, I move for the board to meet in a closed session to discuss performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to negotiations, to consult with counsel, and to perform an administrative function. Makes a second motion to go into executive closed session. This will be an executive closed session. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, good evening. We will close out of executive closed session, Mr. Smith. Yes, we'll close out at, uh, when we're done.